Hey, Mark. Hi there, Glossy. How are you doing? Good, thank you. How are you doing? Very good. Very good. good. Where are you stuck right now? Are you stuck anywhere? I'm I'm in New Zealand. Uh, I am stuck in New Zealand, but we're not stuck in the sense that um, we're out of lockdown and able to move around now. So that's all good. Yeah. yeah, probably one of the best countries to be in in the world right now with with the right. pandemic. Well, you guys have done pretty well. Generally speaking, yes. So. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you so much for joining us. And thanks to the audience for all logging in. Um, we're really happy to have Dr. Mark Erdman with us today. He's working with Conservation International um, and he's also a scientific advisor for the Manta Trust. So he's been a great help to us. So thank you, Mark. Um, he ha also has tons of experience in marine protected area management, um, working with communities, working in Indonesia, and of course, um, tracking big animals like mantas and different types of shark using um, tagging. So that's what he's here to talk to us a bit more about today, um, a bit more about the technique of tagging, why we use tagging, what benefits tagging has, um, and some of his experiences as well. So I'm really excited to hear from him. Um, before we move on to Mark's presentation, I'll just fill you in on the technical information if you haven't joined us before. This webinar will last no more than one hour. We'll have a presentation from Mark and then we'll take questions. So as audience members, you're automatically muted and your video is switched off, um, but we'd love to hear from you. So any questions or comments at any time, just put them in the Q&A box, which is on the bottom of your Zoom toolbar. Sometimes it's on the top of the screen, but it's just a little box that says Q&A. Um, and we will collate these throughout his presentation and ask him as many as we can at the end of the talk. All right, Mark, over to you. All righty. Thanks, Lassie. Let me uh, share my screen here. And get this that looks going. great. Okay, all good. Can you see all that? Good. Enjoy. Okay, thanks. So, um, yes, the topic of today's uh, webinar is the truth about tagging, an honest look at the conservation benefits and limitations of tagging mantis. Um, so in this, I intend to ask the question, why would someone tag a manta, a beautiful animal that it is, um, talk a little bit about the different types of electronic tags and their respective benefits and limitations, um, speak to the practicalities of tagging, and then perhaps most importantly at the end, discuss some of the examples of the conservation benefits of tagging mantas. So, very simple question, why tag mantis? Um, and it seems very simple, but it's actually a profoundly important question before you go tagging mantis. And you'd be surprised at some of the answers that you get when you ask people this. Tagging is sexy, it's cool, it's macho. Um, those are, of course, all horrible reasons to go tagging a manta, um, or for that matter, any marine life. Um, that's not why we would tag. Um, Quite frankly, tagging is a, um, it's an invasive technique. And so it's something that you want to do when there's a real purpose to do such. So tagging can help elucidate the horizontal and vertical movements of mantas in this 3D ocean space that we otherwise can't really easily visualize. So it, it certainly has an importance, but we should really only be doing it when we're trying to answer specific questions of conservation or management significance. So we should never just be tagging just because, in the same way that you would never have a surgery just because. Um, obviously, there has to be a good reason. And I should point out that tagging has been conducted successfully and safely uh, without any long-term detriment that we're aware of um, with a wide variety of different marine life. It also has been done, of course, in the terrestrial realm. But in the marine realm, turtles, sharks, rays, um, whales, dolphins, crocodiles, even on down to grouper, salmon, and that kind of a thing. So um, lots of tagging going on out there. So what types of electronic tags do we have? Typically, there are two main types that we would be talking about. One is the acoustic tag, um, and the other are the various varieties of satellite tags. And I'm going to uh, go through both of those so that you understand the, the differences and the, the benefits and limitations of each. So with acoustic tags, they're basically a, a small tag. Um, it's a very simple notion. It just is transmitting a numerical ID signal. So basically, I'm Manta 5132, 5132, 5132. Um, and it's constantly pinging that, uh, that number as it's swimming around. 
Um, that number will then be recorded every time that a manta that has that tag passes within 500 meters of an acoustic receiver. And you can see there in the photo, um, an acoustic receiver on a mooring there. Um, that's what it looks like. Um, these are relatively inexpensive, only about $400 a tag and about $1,800 US dollars for each receiver. Um, and you only get the data if the animal actually passes close to a receiver. So it's not sending the data to a satellite. It's doing nothing of the sort. It's passive. It basically has to pass by a receiver in order for you to get any uh, type of information from it. Um, as I said, it's relatively inexpensive. It has a long tag battery life because it's not really collecting any data. It's just simply saying 5132, 5132. Um, typically three to five years. Um, some of these will actually last for up to eight years, um, although you would never have one last on a Manta for that long. Uh, and I'll come to that in a bit. Um, they are an excellent choice if you're looking at fine scale movement studies. For instance, moving around a lagoon, uh, a specific atoll or something like that or in places where you have a really large receiver array. Um, an example being in Australia, the IMOS system that they have is 14 different arrays with I think close to 500 receivers that ring the entire island continent of, of Australia, which is of course a really interesting situation and animals moving around anywhere would be, would be um, picked up in that. So um, that's a really interesting possibility there. Um, it does not, these tags do not provide any data on diving behavior. Um, and yeah, they're, they're very passive. Um, and you would typically you would deploy these receivers if you're looking for manta rays um, at manta cleaning stations. Um, that's a, a really good place to pick them up, of course, as they come in uh, typically on a daily basis. And in fact, um, one of the interesting uses here is to look at uh, data on social interactions. Um, a colleague of ours, Rob Perryman and Raj Empot, has done just that recently, um, looking at do mantas come into cleaning stations just randomly, or do they tend to be coming with their friends or family, perhaps? Um, and he has shown that indeed they don't seem to come very randomly, that there, there might actually be some, some long-term social bonds there, which is perhaps not surprising as we look more and more at animals around the planet. Um, here is an example of an array, an acoustic array that we have in West Papua, the Bird's Head Seascape. That's uh, 38 receivers uh, stretching from Raja Ampat down to Kaimana, about a 700 kilometer north to south transect. Um, and those receivers are placed in nine different uh, uh, marine protected areas or MPAs there in order to see if we're getting mantas moving around. Again, this is a small array compared to that Australian IMO system that I mentioned, but nonetheless a relatively big one and a fair bit of effort to keep going. Um, and this has shown some really interesting results. I'll just note that uh, with Raja Empat's oceanic mantas, we find that they're typically, they are moving that entire transect, um, typically 500 kilometers or more. And uh, we know that they are utilizing at least seven of the marine protected areas in the West Papua network. So that's kind of a cool little finding that we got from our acoustic tagging there. Another example, I said we frequently put our receivers on cleaning stations, um, and this is an interesting way to look at the diol patterns of visitation to cleaning stations. And you can see here, uh, oceanic and reef mantas in Rajampat are slightly different, uh, that the oceanics tend to show up a little bit earlier in the morning, and they peak between kind of 9 and 12 uh, in the morning, whereas the reef mantas are peaking uh, kind of afternoon, 12 until uh, until two or three in the afternoon. Um, and so that's actually, of course, very interesting from a perspective of tourism management as well. That was passive acoustic tracking or monitoring. Um, there is also something known as active acoustic tracking. And this is where you have the same exact tag on the Manta, um, but now instead of waiting for the Manta to come by a receiver that, or an array of receivers, you actually try to actively follow it from the surface with a directional hydrophone. Um, this is a pretty cool little technique, but it's very time and labor intensive. You're basically following one animal uh, continuously until it outruns you or goes away um, and you lose track of it. Um, so this is good for a study of individual movement. It works well in places like lagoon situations or if you're dealing with animals that don't move particularly fast. Um, in the case of mantas, uh, this can be quite challenging, but it has been used quite effectively uh, in the situation of lagoons. So those were acoustic tags. Uh, now I'm gonna talk about satellite tagging, um, which is kind of obviously the, the more expensive type of tagging. Um, there's numerous options. And the one thing I want you to remember is that all of them require that the tag's antenna breaks the surface of the water 
both for it to be able to obtain positions um, from either the Argos or GPS satellite network and to transmit data, which it does back to the Argos satellite network. I should note, um, for those of you who don't know, most people knows what, know what a GPS satellite is. Um, the Argo satellite network is a uh, satellite network which is specific for, for um, environmental monitoring data, and that's what's used for pretty much all wildlife tracking uh, studies around the world. Um, so in a satellite tag, there's an onboard computer um, that records various parameters, usually including depth, temperature, sometimes light level and position. And that then transmits uh, the data uh, back to the Argo satellite network, which allows us uh, as researchers to actually track these animals sitting at our desk and looking at our computer, which is pretty cool, but it also means that these are significantly more expensive. Most satellite tags are ranging between two to 6,000 US dollars per tag. Some of the examples of different uh, satellite tags that we have, there's a spot tag, which is pretty much the, the cheapest of the satellite tags running uh, out there. These are simple location trackers, um, and they just simply send Argos position data and temperature data in some cases whenever the animal is on the surface. So this is really good for animals that spend a lot of time on the surface. For instance, um, it would be excellent for turtles. Um, they're rugged, they're pretty inexpensive, um, and they're accurate to about 250 meters. Um, they do work for mantas, uh, because mantas obviously do come to the surface to feed, um, but they're, um, it's perhaps limited use in mantas just because they don't spend that much time on the surface typically. And again, this is primarily a horizontal tracking tool. Um, some of the newer models actually incorporate something called FastLock GPS technology, which I'll talk about in just a second, and those are actually accurate to 20 meters. So those are um, very uh, exciting indeed. I'll come back to that in a second. Probably the most well-known type of satellite tag is what's known as a pop-up satellite archival tag or PSAT tag. Um, and these tags record depth, temperature, and light level typically. Um, they are used predominantly for animals that are not frequently on the surface, where a spot tag won't really give you much data uh, in terms of position data. Um, and they also, of course, are recording great data in terms of the diving behavior, the vertical behavior, because you are getting depth and temperature. They're programmed to release from the animal after a set time period. And what happens in that case is that you know, you program it to stay on the animal, say, for six months. And at the end of six months, basically the computer says, ah, time to pop off. And it sends a little bit of a, uh, electric current from the battery down to where the tag is attached to a tether and basically burns through uh, the, the connection there. And then it pops off, it's highly buoyant, comes to the surface and transmits to the satellite network. Um, so I would say with mantas, these are typically programmed to pop off within six to 12 months. Um, I'm not aware of anyone trying to go much beyond that because the batteries really wouldn't last. Um, and I should note that you don't receive any data until the tag actually pops off. Um, and it's important to note that the tag uses up the majority of its battery when it's transmitting the data. That's a very energy intensive activity. And so the data that it's been gathering for six months or 12 months or three months or whatever um, is typically sent as daily summary statistics. So it might be sampling actually the, the temperature and the depth and the light level every 10 seconds but there's no way that it's gonna be able to send all that data to, uh, to the satellite. So it gives instead these 12 hour histograms or something like that, and it sends it out in randomized order until the battery actually dies. Now that gives you some, some certainly very valuable data from the tags, but even better is if you're able to recover that tag after it pops off, because then you can download directly um, the high resolution data set which is on it, which might be, for instance, 10 second data uh, on its diving behavior and so forth. Now I should note that those, those tags are excellent for getting dive data on manta rays, um, but this is a very important thing that people frequently don't notice about PAT tags is that they are not giving actual position data. So they are not, um, again, they're, they're designed to, to be uh, on animals that aren't really coming to the surface very much. So they are geolocating uh, based on light levels and the time of sunset and sunrise. So it's an estimation, it's an algorithm, which this data is fed through to estimate where that animal is. And so that's really important to note. Sometimes people get back the data from a mini pat tag and they think that they have a track. 
Um, and I need to really stress that that's not the case. They are estimates of where the animal went. And here's an example of a, a whale shark, which uh, we tagged in, um, in West Papua. And I can assure you, it did not go to the North Pole and back multiple times. Um, that, that's, that's what happens when you're dealing with light level data. Now, a way of getting at that uh, and, and dealing with this is instead to use what I call the Rolls-Royce of, uh, of satellite tags for mantas, and this is, these are FastLock GPS splash tags. So these are archival tags, they're pop-off, um, but they're using that FastLock GPS technology, which basically means that if the manta comes to the surface, even for a, a second or less, um, that tag is able to take a snapshot um, of all the GPS satellites in the sky and it's able to get a really accurate uh, position uh, fix in, in frequently milliseconds. Um, it also of course is recording depth and temperature uh, and this highly accurate position data. Um, it's expensive, uh, they're big tags so there's a lot of drag on them so frequently they only stay on for one or two months but the data that you get and in particular the tracks that you get are 100% accurate and, and very much something that you can believe. Um, we have had success at having them stay on for up to six months at a time. And they do attempt to transmit data whenever they're on the surface. So for an animal that happens to be on the surface a lot, you will be getting basically close to real-time data on where it is, as well as some of its diving behavior. The last couple of tags that I'll mention and not go really into, there's something called a survivorship tag. Um, I don't know if Betty talked about this last night in her webinar, uh, Manta Trust webinar, but um, these are used to basically look at survivorship of animals that have been caught as bycatch in fisheries and that are going to be released. So Betty is actually doing this, um, for, for those of you who watched her webinar last night, um, on mobula rays being caught in fisheries in, in Indonesia. And in this case, the tag pops off after a program time, let's say 30 days or 60 days, or if the depth remains constant on the tag or the animal stops moving for um, more than uh, six hours or something. So then you know that the animal actually died, unfortunately. And this is a great way to look at whether uh, if animals are released for, as bycatch, do they actually survive or not. There's also something known as a daily diary tag. Um, this in another sense is really a Rolls Royce tag because it does not only depth, temperature, and light level, but also it has accelerometer, a magnetometer and a speed sensor. Um, and these are really, really good for, um, you know, looking at how the animal is moving. Is it doing somersault feeding? Is it moving fast through the water, slow through the water? What is it doing exactly? Um, but that's a very um, intense little tag that's actually very expensive as well. And so typically they are meant to pop off after a very short time period, maybe a couple of hours or days to ensure that you're able to get them and the manta or whatever animal doesn't run off um, kilometers away and, 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 uh, and take your tag with it. That's only beginning to be experimented with um, and uh, that's with a particular necklace type of attachment which uh, uh, we have not yet tried, but it's very exciting. So on to tagging practicalities. How do you attach a tag to a manta? Um, and I, I hope I'm not going to upset anyone with this, but you use a pole spear um, to deploy the tag with a titanium dart tip that typically has a stainless steel tether. Um, and this anchor is the tag in the back of the animal. Um, I note that we only do this with pole spears, not with spear guns. Um, and that's because with a pole spear, you can very accurately control how hard you're releasing the, 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 the spear. Um, and also it requires that you be very close to the manta so that there's no way that you're going to accidentally, you know, miss aim and end up hitting uh, the manta in the middle of the body. That's really important. Um, if you look where you're going to, to insert the tag, um, you can see the upper uh, manta on the right there. Uh, basically you want to insert the tag in that crease between the central body cavity where you have all the internal organs and the wings. Um, Obviously, you don't want to put it in the, the, the central body cavity because that could, could damage internal organs, but you also don't really want to put it out on the end of the wingtip either because then there would be a lot of um, motion and, and the tag would probably come out. So if you get it in that crease, that's really the sweet spot. And uh, I put some bullseyes there to show you what we typically aim for. Um, and there you can see doing exactly that. Um, now, I will note there is something known as a fin mount attachment. Um, that is something which requires the capture of the animal and the through bolting of a tag through the dorsal fin. 
um, which is a, a much more involved process. It does give excellent long-term tagging data. Um, those can stay on for years, um, but it's a much more invasive technique and it can cause deformities in dorsal fins. This is being done a lot on sharks, um, but some of the bigger sharks like um, great white sharks and, and tiger sharks are, are showing significant deformities from that. So there's a lot of question as to whether this is really a good thing. Um, it's generally not used on mantas, but there are some researchers in special situations that are pioneering this. We've chosen not to do that um, just because it looks to us to be a bit too invasive. Um, I do note though that we are doing this with whale sharks in, in West Papua, um, where they are being captured uh, accidentally in these lift nets. And that allows us the opportunity to do the surgery, to put the fin mount on. Um, you can see there is its bling, um, which it's happily swimming around with. And that gives you some quite spectacular data, really, um, long-term data sets. Uh, some of those tags will, will um, transmit for two and a half years, and then you're able to get these kinds of, of uh, data tracks, which are quite spectacular, really. Um, and, and this is the, a world first for, for whale sharks, I might add. Um, and the stout dorsal fins of the whale sharks don't show any deformation, and we have very rapid healing of those fins when the tag is removed or when it's shed. So we feel pretty confident with that technique with whale sharks, but uh, would never try it on, on manta rays. And of course, this comes to probably the most important question for many people, does it hurt the manta? Um, and I'm going to say the manta certainly feels the dart when it enters its back. Um, we can never know, of course, for sure uh, until we learn how to talk to mantas, but it's probably like a hypodermic needle for humans. And what you see when you do this is that the smaller animals will rapidly swim away. Um, the larger ones often don't. Uh, frequently a big oceanic manta just gives a little bit of a flinch um, and maybe turns around and looks at you and says, what did you just do, you silly human? Um, we do commonly encounter tag mantas within 10 to 20 minutes um, of tagging, so they frequently come back and we'll see them again. And I would note that there is no evidence of these mantas just you know, fleeing the area and never coming back. Um, and I'll show a, a few videos here. Um, here's a manta, an oceanic manta at a cleaning station. Um, and you'll see that's what it looks like. It's not particularly perturbed. It actually turns around and comes back. Um, after that, um, I'll show you another one here where it definitely leaves. Here's another oceanic manta. Um, you'll see it's swimming through the school of jacks. It's going to come over the top of me. I'll get a, a photo ID of its belly and then quickly put an acoustic tag into it. And you will see that it will swim away. Absolutely. Um, but shortly thereafter, it showed up on numerous of our receivers around, so we know that it did not actually flee the area by any means. Here's a manta that was just tagged about five minutes ago, and it's now come back, and you can see um, it's not particularly perturbed by me. It's, it's turning around, um, swimming by me, um, and I actually spent about a half an hour with this manta afterwards. It didn't seem to, didn't seem to hold any grudges towards me afterwards, so anyway, just to give you an idea of what that looks like. Um, okay, and that of course comes up with an idea, how would one approach a manta to be able to tag it, um, if you have the heart to do such, that is. Um, I would say that tagging at a cleaning station is definitely the optimal situation because the mantas are relaxed and they're hovering, and it means that the researcher can approach calmly and take a very careful aim, noting again, this is an invasive technique and you do need to be very careful. Um, and it, it can also even allow you to take a photo ID at the same time. If you see in this photo, which uh, Sarah Lewis took of me, I'm, I'm both uh, getting an ID with a, uh, a GoPro as well as tagging the, mat the, the manta at the same time. Um, it is possible to tag mantas when they are in feeding or cruising situations, but I would say that should only be done by tigers that have very good pole spear skills, um, and it still requires you to be very calm and patient when you approach the mantas. Um, here's just an example to show you how you should approach a manta. Again, you do not want to come in at it fast. Take your time, nice and slow, calm sure that you properly aim. So, so nothing fast and rushed about that, okay? Um, another practicality, how long should the tether be? Um, so for acoustic and PSAT tags, those are typically very short tethers, um, 10 to 15 centimeters at most. Um, because you're not trying to get them up to, to do any transmitting. Uh, you're, you're just trying to keep them relatively close to the body. 
Um, for those tags where you're trying to transmit, um, earlier studies that were that used these frequently used a one meter long tether um, to maximize the the possibility of those tags getting up onto the surface. Um, I'm surprised at that. Uh, to me, there's a real issue of tangling there, and indeed, most of those studies did not have their tags last on the the animals very long. Um, in fact, we found that even with 50 centimeter tethers, quite short, um, the tags still tend to trail behind the manta, and that can act as a lure to jacks or barracudas or sharks or Spanish mackerel uh, to come in and actually eat your tag, um, which is, of course, something you wouldn't really want to have happen. So we typically use 25 centimeter long tethers, and we tag very far forward on the manta to ensure that it doesn't trail behind the, the, the manta, the tag doesn't trail behind the manta and attract predators. Um, th this gives you fewer transmissions, but you still get uh, plenty of fast lock positions in the case of those splash tags. Um, and this, I'm gonna show you a video of what happens when the, this is one of our earlier deployments. You can see the tag is trailing quite far behind the manta there. And you're gonna see that absolutely is an irresistible lure to jacks um, in the vicinity who then come flying in. Those aren't even very big jacks. Um, and they immediately start attacking the tag and the runs off. Um, so we quickly learned our lesson from that um, and stopped doing it that way. Now, if you can see there, um, we use a very short tether and again, very far forward on, on the animal. Um, and here's a, a, a drone footage from my colleague, Eddie Setiwan, uh, of a uh, baby manta that he's just tagged. Um, I want to call your attention to this, but watch this. You can see how that tag is floating right up on the surface, and it's busy getting lots of good GPS position data as well as transmitting during that time. So that's kind of the optimal situation you want to have with a satellite tag um, in order to be getting really good data. Uh, and and that, that baby manta gave us spectacularly good data. Just a little guy is only about 1.5 meters across. Um, okay, what about tag fouling? Um, this is an issue which is a really big issue. Um, so tags left in the water, if they are not specifically coated, will get fouled. They'll get barnacles, they'll get algae, bryozoans, all kinds of things on them. And badly fouled tags continuously rub and irritate the animal skin. So um, we are absolutely careful that that never is the case. Um, but I should note that most of the anti-fouling paints or coatings which are out there for boats and things are highly toxic. They use tributyl tin or other really toxic uh, um, substances in the paint, which doesn't seem like it would be very good to have on a matte skin. So what we use is something called Prop Speed, which is a non-toxic silicon-based ablative coating. Um, it's expensive for a can of it, um, but we feel that it's, it's, on, it's only the right thing to do um, if you're going to be uh, tagging these mattas. You need to make sure that those tags aren't going to get, uh, get fouled. And I would add that with acoustic tags that typically might last a couple of years uh, on, on an animal, um, Internal tagging is actually highly preferable, where you just um, put them into the body cavity and, and suture them in, um, which is what people typically do do with sharks. Um, unfortunately, with mattas, that's, well, at least to my knowledge, it hasn't been done because it would require that you have to capture the matta, which is something that we at least fastidiously want to avoid. Um, how long does the tag stay on the manta? Um, with pop-off satellite tags, they're user programmed. Um, and with mantas, typically we program for six months, maximally 12 months. Um, when they pop off, I note that the dart tip and the tether are left behind. But normally, once there's no um, drag on them anymore and they're not being kind of held in with the anchor, um, they'll work their way out of the skin within a month or so after the tag pops off. Um, frequently tags will come out prematurely after only a couple of weeks to months. Um, that could be because the manta was frequently breaching. It could be they turned over and were scraping on the bottom. Uh, tag predators, as I showed you, as well as just the drag. So um, it is very common when you put tags out that they don't last for the six months that you were hoping that they would. Um, and I should add that the acoustic tags, again, can stay on for up to two to three years, but then they eventually always work their way out of the skin. So down to the most important part of the talk, um, the uses of tagging data in manta conservation and management. Um, I've already mentioned uh, a bit earlier about this horizontal movement data and the cleaning station visitation data can be extremely useful for tourism management, uh, both in terms of saying where tourists maybe can go to see mantas, but also maybe where you don't want tourists to go um, if you want to give the mantas some breaks uh, or particular times uh, of the day when you don't want people bothering them. 
Um, so that, that's a very important use of tagging data. Um, they can also, this, this data can be very useful in helping to site or zone marine protected areas uh, and tourism management areas where, the, where you're particularly worried about the manta rays. Here's some data, something known as a heat map um, from a colleague of mine, Shannon Murphy, doing her master's in Milne Bay in Papua New Guinea. And um, I'll just point that the, the, the smaller red dot down there at the bottom is a cleaning station known as Bonabala Bala, uh, which was the one known area for mantas in Milne Bay. And that's where we tagged these mantas. But then after they were tagged there, many of them went to the north and you can see that um, yellow, red ball of sun, um, as well as the, 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 the um, other polygons around that. And that, that's, again, a heat map showing where you're most likely to find the mantas um, over the, the course of a six month period. And um, so this basically revealed that there was another big area for cleaning and feeding for mantas there. And so now working with the, the Milne Bay government, the idea is to try to set aside some specific manta MPAs uh, in this region, which is kind of a cool thing. Um, I should also add the horizontal movement data can elucidate areas where mantas are subject to ship strike um, and where you need to control boats. This is Uvea in uh, New Caledonia, and you can see my colleagues at CI New Caledonia um, created this very nice little animation of the way that this uh, mantas data uh, showed it. And what you'll see is by no means does the manta just swim around randomly. Um, it has very specific tracks that it tends to use back and forth. And this really highlights areas of that lagoon where if boats were going back and forth at high speed, there would be a real potential issue with, with boat collisions. And so this data is being used to specifically um, suggest uh, that boats shouldn't be going through those channels, for instance, at high speed important. Um, here's another really important one, which I, I love this, this example of tagging data uh, from, from baby mantas. Um, so the Wyag Lagoon in northern Rajampat has long been suspected as a pupping area. Um, frequently when we go into that lagoon, we see babies uh, under two meters, typically 1.5 meters across, um, really small mantas. Um, but by deploying satellite tags on those, we were able to really confirm and show conclusively that this area is an important nursery for them. And I'll show you what I mean by that. This is a track from a baby manta tagged in YAG. And what, what that's basically showing is that over the course of those uh, four months that this data is from, the manta basically stayed within the lagoon almost exclusively with only a few short forays out into the deeper water around. Um, and what this says, of course, is that those protected lagoons are really important for baby mantas. Um, and in this particular case, we, we believe it is a nursery. Um, by knowing that, we were able to share that data with the Rajampat MPA Authority. And so the government has now uh, created new regulations to protect that lagoon and basically prevent some of the previous um, high speed speed boats that were moving around in it and again potentially um, endangering those animals. Um, this is a, an animation that uh, my colleague Eddie Sediawan did of two of the mantas tagged there, baby mantas, and you can see the, the green and red dots moving around and again they're just staying within that lagoon area the entire time um, for about a four month period um, and indeed we now have longer term data which suggests that they stay there for about two years before they move out. So um, very useful data there. Um, to prove to the government the need for that extra protection. And indeed, here's a little um, thing that was put out by the Rajampa government explaining why uh, people have to be very careful uh, when they move about within the lagoon. Um, I'll use another Indonesian uh, uh, um, example of where tagging data is important. Uh, Indonesia, of course, has four big manta tourism sites in Bali, Rajampat, Komodo, and uh, East Kalimantan. This makes uh, Indonesia overall the second largest manta tourism destination in the world. Um, and there's about $15 million coming in from it. Um, and until recently, and I think Sarah Lewis, my colleague, uh, talked about this on Monday night, um, there have been two major manta hunting areas as well in Indonesia. So here you can see where the four tourism sites are in blue and then the two hunting areas in red. Now <clears throat> based on a, a uh, argument about mantanomics and why mantas are worth much more alive than dead, the Indonesian Ministry of Marine Affairs and Fisheries in 2014 gave full protection to mantas uh, which has basically created the world's largest uh, manta sanctuary, six million square kilometers um, in 2014. But while they had officially protected mantas, the ministry was initially unsure of whether they should really be pursuing 
active enforcement in these two manta hunting regions. So there were some that said, ah, oh, we don't really want to go after the, the poor fishermen there. You know, we'll just make sure that we protect the mantas well in the four areas where there's tourism. But satellite tagging was able to show very conclusively that the mantas from the tourism areas were regularly moving through the hunting areas. And I'll show you what I mean by that. So here's uh, mantas tagged in Bali, which is again, uh, the, the, the the, the biggest of the, the um, manta tourism sites. And you can see that the satellite tags showed very conclusively that those mantas didn't just stay around Bali, they actually moved to the east and into Lombok uh, into a manta hunting ground. That then provided the necessary proof to the Indonesian government that really justified the need for enhanced enforcement uh, against those illegal hunting activities. Similarly in Komodo, um, our tagging there was able to show that, um, that the mantas would typically move to the west towards Bali so you have this type of a situation where the two main manta tourism areas, um, the mantas from those areas are moving through on a regular basis through the, the hunting area. Um, very important, so that, that tagging data in, in um, justifying to the Indonesian government why they needed to do enforcement. And the last one, which I'll show, um, diving behavior also has conservation implications. This is some data um, from uh, our work in, in New Caledonia, uh, Manta Trust project there. Um, and there we've shown very conclusively that, uh, that the mantas are frequently doing very deep dives. Uh, in the case of, uh, of reef mantas, they're typically um, <clears throat> going below 500 meters, and in fact, as deep as 672 meters. And what that really shows is that <clears throat> if you simply are doing MPAs that are kind of to the edge of the reef and then they stop, you're going to miss these mantas, which are going off of the reef and into really deep water. Um, and if you really want to protect the mantas, and they are important, of course, from a tourism perspective, you need to worry about what's happening when they're going off of the reef, out of the MPAs, and potentially interacting negatively with deep fishing gear. So again, an example where tagging data really was able to show something important that way. So my overall summary, um, acoustic and satellite telemetry, also known as biologging, uh, are very powerful techniques to investigate the secret lives of mantas and other marine animals, which we otherwise can't easily see. Um, data from manta tagging studies can be absolutely invaluable in formulating conservation policy and in informing tourism management for mantas. Um, but it's important to always remember tagging is an invasive technique and it should only be conducted with proper training and preparation and only when there's a very clear need for the tagging data. And with that, I will say thank you and uh, I'm more than happy to try to answer any questions if I can. Thank you so much, Mark. That was really informative. Um, I love the little manta nursery. That, that must be a cool area to go see the mantas in. It's a very cool area, very cool area. So should I stop the, the screen share now, Fossil? Yeah, that would probably be best. Okay. There you go. All right, we've had quite a few really good questions, so I'll launch right in. Um, we have one from Asti. So Asti said, thank you for the explanation. This is really interesting. I have a question about how to prevent the poachers from using the tagging data for abusive hunting of the protected species. Okay. That's a, an excellent question, um, one which, which has certainly been thought a lot about, and that what I would say is a couple of things. Firstly, um, this tagging data is not publicly available, um, right? It's, it's, it's available to the person who has the, the Argo satellite account. Um, so it, it's not something which is just available to anyone. Uh, only the person who owns that data can actually see it. Now you do see in some cases, uh, for instance, with our whale shark tagging data, we actually do have a website where we put that up so that people can kind of see where the whale sharks are going because we think it's actually quite exciting and helps promote you know, um, a, a love of marine life. Um, but what we have specifically done in that case is we've done a 10 day offset. So in other words, you don't, what you see is today's data is actually 10 days ago data. And that prevents people from ever really being able to know where the mantas are, or in this case, whale sharks. Um, the other thing I would note is that in the case of mantas in particular, um, because they don't spend very much time on the surface, it's actually very, very rare. In fact, almost never do you really get real-time data on where they are. You would usually at the, the very best that you're going to get is kind of an idea of where they were yesterday. Um, and indeed that could be used uh, to, by manta poachers if they were able to get their hands on it, but in that case we typically just simply don't share that data um, while it's coming out, that is, only afterwards. Okay, cool, very useful, thank you. Um, okay, tons of questions. 
What, so you've tagged a lot of animals and you've been in the water with tons of animals, I think, over your lifetime. What's your favorite animal to be in the water with? Um, well, I love mantis. I mean, I love yeah. that. But I, I, yeah, I think that mantis, obviously, biggest brain to body mass ratio of any fish. And, uh, you know, they just really, the, the, in fact, I hate tagging mantis, if I can be perfectly oh. honest because I would much prefer to just be interacting with a manta um, and, and having some of those really um, special moments uh, which you can have. I know that sounds cheesy, but uh, I've had a lot of special moments with mantas. And so I'd, I'd much prefer to not be tagging them actually. Um, so yeah, I would say mantas overall, um, noting that I also do a lot of work on the world's smallest fishes, the, the micro gobies, as well as the world's largest fish, the, uh, the whale shark and everything in between. I, I quite frankly, I'm a fish geek. I like them all, but, uh, but mantas are definitely the coolest. So. Okay, great. I'm glad you said mantis. I'm a little bit biased as well. Okay, um, what should we do next? Okay, we have one from Mohammed. He said, hello, Mark. How do we tag a fast swimming animal such as a thresher shark? Is it possible to use the dart pole or do you need to catch them first? Another excellent question. So um, typically with most sharks, um, tagging is, is frequently done um, by, by catching them first, right? So they're, they're frequently brought in on a line. Um, and then if in the right situation, like what we do with white sharks here in New Zealand, um, you'll basically just pull them right alongside the boat, keep the boat moving so there's water coming across their gills, quickly um, tag them and release them. Um, if you look on Shark Week and things like that on TV, you'll frequently see these um, very macho type of operations where they pull the sharks on board and maybe they have hoses running through their gills and things, which to me seems a bit of an overkill and something which I, I would personally always want to avoid because again, um, I, you want to minimize the stress to the animal. Um, but in the case of thresher sharks, uh, the work that uh, my colleague Rafid uh, is doing in, in Alor in Indonesia, um, he's actually working with thresher shark fishermen. And when they catch the sharks, he tags them and then releases them, pay, pays them actually to, to release them. So, yeah. Okay, well, that's a good option. At least you're not catching fresh sharks and stressing them out. Yeah. Okay, we've had a good one from Lelia, or Lelia, yeah, Lelia maybe. Um, she said, if you only have two tags, would you prefer to tag a male adult and a female adult, or an adult and a juvenile, um, disregarding of their sex? Does that make sense? <laughs> yep, no, those are excellent questions as well. And I would say, you know, what I want to stress here really is that um, what I've said throughout the, the presentation, that um, you only do tagging if you have a very specific question that you're trying to answer that, that has some sort of management significance. I mean, obviously you could just go out there and tag willy-nilly and probably you'd get something interesting. I mean, everything that mantas do is, are interesting. But um, again, because it's an invasive technique, I would never do it unless you have a specific question. And so I would basically turn it back to you that I would, I would choose whether I was doing males, females, juveniles, et cetera, depending upon what the question was that I was asking. Um, and in some cases, you absolutely want to know what both males and females are doing. If what you were trying to do is figure out where are females giving birth, um, then obviously you'd be wanting to only tag pregnant females. If you were trying to ask what are babies doing, then you would be probably tagging babies and not worrying if they were males or females. So again, it really comes down to what, you, what you're trying to get at. If you're just doing a, a general manta movement type of situation, then you typically would try to have both males and females. So. Okay, great answer, thank you. And um, this is slightly linked to this from Julia. Julia said, do you ever re-tag mantas that have already been tagged? Is that beneficial um, for you? Um, uh, great question. Um, and I would say that in our case, I don't think that we've ever done that um, with mantis. Um, we have absolutely done it with whale sharks. Um, and that has proven to be really useful with some of these whale sharks because we have in some cases five years of nearly continuous tagging data because after the first tag came out, we re-tagged them and then after the second tag came out and, or the battery died and we took it off and put a new one on. Um, and in that case, but that's a slightly different situation because we actually have the whale sharks being captured in nets um, where you immediately can say, oh, this is one that we know and you know, maybe it's got a, a, an old tag on it that we can take off and then put a new one on. With mantas, um, 
again, I have to be honest, like I, I so hate tagging Mantis that, um, that I, I think I would feel horrible tagging one a second time, to be very honest with you. Um, there, I could see situations where it might be justified, um, but uh, yeah, we, we just haven't really had that opportunity. So I haven't had to face that dilemma yet, to be honest with you. <laughs> okay. It's interesting that the whale sharks are the same ones that get caught in the nets um, again and again. Yeah, well, See, th this is the difference. Mantas are very smart, um, and oh. as much as I love whale sharks, I have to say they are dumb as dirt. Um, and, and so you tend to see the same ones getting caught over and over. Um, so, yeah. oh, <laughs> very oh, different oh, animals. Oh. Both Both the whale animals. Sharks. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, cool. Um, we have a good one from Jose. He said, thanks, Mark. Fantastic presentation and very useful. You mentioned about social behavior patterns of mantas. Are there any recent findings on this that are derived from tagging studies? So um, I was specifically referring to a uh, PhD study by um, a fellow, Rob Perryman, uh, who was doing his work in, in Raja Ampat with colleagues, uh, including from the State University of Papua. And um, th that is very much a, a, an active line of questioning right now. Um, I think that it's, it's, it's been shown in a number of other animals that actually um, animals don't just randomly associate, that frequently there are social networks that, that are at play there. And so Rob was really using acoustic tagging to look at, okay, um, we tend to see, and he, he actually initially got this information looking at, I believe, at photo ID data, where they would see, okay, whenever we have the, this animal coming into a cleaning station, typically we also have that animal coming into a cleaning station. They tend to arrive together. And that was being seen over and over again. And of course, you're lucky if you get to see that with a photo ID, but if you actually use acoustic tags, it means that every single time that they come to that, where whether you're in the water or not, you're gonna get a recording. So um, he did that uh, on a relatively small scale and I believe got some really interesting information. Now, of course, the, the other question that then immediately comes out of that is, okay, we're seeing this non-random uh, behavior. They're not just aggregating randomly, but showing up together. Why is that? Are they friends? Are they, you know, lovers? <laughs> are they are they brothers, sisters? You know, wh what's going on there? And to do that actually then requires, of course, um, combining genetic data as well. And I believe that that's kind of a next step in that that study. It's not one which I'm involved in, but uh, but I think it's a really interesting line of reason, a line of questioning right now. Yeah, super interesting. I, I read the paper, I think it must have been by Perryman. Um, yeah. It was a paper published, yeah, and there was lots of, I think they showed there was groups of uh, adult females that would hang around together, is that right, at the cleaning stations? Yeah. Super interesting. Um, all right, we've had a few questions about this. One's from Samisi, um, who else have we had it from? Uh, Miriam, a few different people asking, is there any organization that certifies divers to do underwater manta satellite tagging? And how can you get trained to do this, this kind of research? Great question. Um, I am not aware of any particular organization that, that certifies. Um, I have certainly trained a number of people uh, in how to do manta tagging. Um, Sarah Lewis, who was uh, the, the webinar uh, host of uh, Monday, has done it with a number of Indonesian colleagues as well. Um, so I would say, you know, Manta Trust certainly uh, is a great place to, to, to check in, I would say. Um, at CI, uh, if, if, if it's a country that I work in, I'm always happy to, to train people in that as well. Um, from my perspective, again, it's really important to train people because we don't want people doing it the wrong way or for the wrong reason. So um, yeah, drop me an email. Perhaps uh, I'll be happy to come and, and help train you, I guess I would say, or through Mantatron. Okay, cool. Um, okay, we have one from Swenzen. Sorry, I've probably said that wrong, so I apologize. Um, but they are asking, we see technology playing a big role in manta conservation. What would be your wish list technology, tools, equipment, et cetera, compared to what is available now for tagging mm -hmm. to minimize disruption to the mantas whilst being able to collect the data that you need? Great 
Great, 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 great question. Um, because obviously if we could get to a point where there was no need to actually penetrate the skin of a manta, um, that would be a much more preferable situation. There's a really interesting new technology which is being tried on mobula rays in the Azores. Um, uh, Betty, who gave a talk last night, I believe, um, I'm not sure if she mentioned this, but her PhD advisor has pioneered an interesting type of, of tagging technique where it's basically, it's a, it's a necklace, it's a, a harness, which goes around the cephalic fins of the, uh, the manta. Um, actually, he hasn't tried it on mantas before, they only do it on mobula rays, um, devil rays, um, but, but it works beautifully and they look, I mean, obviously they're in the same genus. So uh, it seems like it might very well work on mantas as well. Um, it's not, currently a long-term tagging technique. Um, normally, I don't think it lasts on the, on the mantis for more than a couple of days at most. Um, but, you know, we're also getting to the point where maybe we don't need some of, some of the, the, that data that we were, um, in, was important to get with tagging. Maybe we've gotten by that. Um, and, and now we're interested in, in new questions. Um, and I think that something like this, to me, is a really promising one. Again, that has magnetometers and accelerometers and speed and it has a critter cam so you can actually see where the mantas are going what they're seeing it's i think it's a low light camera so it can actually um record even at, at night um which is pretty interesting so i think yeah critter cams in particular they're not a tag obviously but if, if you can get it so that you're actually seeing what the mantas are seeing and seeing what they're doing um that is a really cool uh, next step and there, there has been some work done actually through manta trust of attaching mantas with uh, attaching critter cams with suction cups to the back of, of mantas um, and i think that's been at least moderately successful um, but uh, i think if, if we can keep working on that uh, that that's certainly preferable to having to, to stick uh, tags into them if possible okay great yeah one of my favorite stories was when they used the suction cup critter cams and they couldn't find anything to suction it onto the manta i don't know if you heard about this so they needed some kind of material to use to suction it on and in the end the thing that worked was i think crunchy peanut butter not smooth peanut butter so they used them to suction it onto the mantas and they filmed for maybe up to 24 hours but there was one really cool video of a manta breaching with the the critical on and yeah some really cool results fascinating uh. okay um what's next okay from Simi C, um, they said, how would one differentiate between cleaning, feeding, and mating stations from manta tagging results? Um, that's a really, really good question. And what I would say is that, um, uh, you know, with satellite tags, typically what you would be able to see is where mantas are feeding because uh, well in particular when they're doing surface feeding um, so if there's an area where they're surface feeding that's where they're going to be up on the surface that's where you're going to get all this good position data um, and you can pretty much know that if that's something that you see regularly in a similar area that's probably a feeding area a surface feeding area on plankton um, if they go to a cleaning station um, that is not something that you're going to see directly from the, uh, the the tagging data unless you get the really high resolution data and you can see from the diving data that they're going to say eight meters and spending large amounts of time at eight meters and then they come up and down then you might be able to figure that out but in reality what frequently ends up happening in our experience at least is that um, as I showed with the Milne Bay Papua New Guinea stuff um, we tagged the animals at a given cleaning station they then moved and were clean were feeding in an area quite some far away about 60 kilometers away um, when we then went over there to see where they were feeding it didn't take us long to find another cleaning station that was right there um, and so that's the kind of thing we see as for mating um, I would say you know the Mating is uh, something which is um, still somewhat mysterious in manta rays. Uh, the Maldives certainly is a great place to watch it happening, but in many places, um, you know, you might see mating trains, but uh, but but actually watching the mating is something which is not many people uh, beyond, for instance, Guy Stevens have, have done much work on that. It's it's a relatively rare thing to see, actually, um, and yeah. certainly no no giving birth um, uh, other than in aquariums so far, I think. So. Yeah. Guy is one of the luckiest people in the water. He gets to see everything. Um, yeah. Cool. Have you ever seen manta mating? Me personally? Yeah. Um, I've certainly seen lots of manta 
courtship behavior, um, but I have not actually seen the deed. Uh, no, me either. Yeah. I'd love to, in a weird way. Okay, um, we've got a good one from Derek. Derek said, thanks for the presentation, Mark. With acoustic tags, are specific tags attached on one specimen able to be identified by arrays in different areas? For example, a tag in Raja Ampat able to be also identified in the Australian array. Thank you. Yes, um, and that's that's a great question. And um, uh, I actually just had this exact situation arise um, two weeks ago when I was in southern New Zealand um, doing some filming of white sharks there. Uh, and we had, I think, about 20 different IDs that we got on different white sharks. And on the fifth day, uh, one showed up with an acoustic tag on it. Um, now, in this particular case, I didn't actually have any, I didn't have a receiver, so we weren't able to, to get the, 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 the number on it that way, but I just simply put out the information thinking it probably had come from Australia and having a photo ID of it, and uh, I, within a day I was able to find the, the man in New South Wales who had tagged that animal. But it is true that um, when we're looking at our array, when we pick up our array, pick up our receivers, um, occasionally you will get what looks like a really odd number uh, on there and, and it looks like oh we've got an animal that that's not from our not one of our animals not one of our tagged animals and there is um, data confidentiality there but because everyone is pretty much using this from the same company called Vemco in, in Canada um, all I have to do then is I just simply write to Vemco and I say hey we've got an, an animal, I have no idea what animal, but something went by our receiver that was tag number 57322. Um, can you tell me what this is? And they'll say, yes, we'll contact the owner of that uh, that tag and, and get back to you. And then they'll put you in touch and then you find out, oh, you know, that was a grouper that swam from, from 500 meters, kilometers away. So very interesting. Yes, that absolutely does happen on a regular basis. Um, of course, only with animals that actually swim that far, which is not all animals, including most reef mantas, don't go that far. But uh, yeah. That must be really exciting to find out what it is eventually. Uh, very much so. Yeah. <laughs> That's very cool. All yeah. right, I'm aware we're a little bit low on time, so I might just ask you about your book recommendation. We've started a Manta Trust book club for anyone watching, um, where we have recommendations from people working across the sphere of marine science, underwater photography, all sorts of things, um, recommending their favorite books about the natural world. So I think Mark might have one. For us. I do. I'll actually I'll give two. Um, I'll give two. So um, this one is actually, I think, uh, from Guy Stevens' PhD advisor, Callum Roberts. It's uh, oh, yeah. the Unnatural History of the Sea. And I don't know, is that already on your list? Because if it's already on your list, then I'll give you a different I think one. it is. I think a while back somebody suggested maybe Annie, Annie yeah. Murray. Okay. It is a spectacular book that really details. Um, how humans have been impacting the oceans for a lot longer time than you might have thought. Um, so then I'm gonna give you a different one. Um, this is The Extreme Life of the Sea um, by Steve Palumbi and his son, Anthony Palumbi. Um, another really good book, um, which goes through all kinds of interesting factoids about all the really incredible things that sea creatures do. So um, th those would be my two that I would probably yeah. recommend. Okay, the second one I've never heard of one. It's not on the list, so it's a great addition. And yeah, okay. the one by Callum, he was my professor for my master's, so it was one of my course reading books. It was a great book. Um, okay, thank you. What, what are your future plans? What have you got planned in the next few weeks or months? Um, well, tomorrow we have a day off and I am headed down the coast uh, to do some abalone diving actually um, so be, and hopefully not running into any white sharks when i'm doing it um and beyond that you know i'm free to move around new zealand but at this moment in time can't go anywhere else um i was supposed to be helping with a number of different projects in indonesia but uh don't know when i'm going to be able to leave and go go there so um yeah right now just enjoying the new zealand winter <laughs> so. okay well i hope you enjoy the abalone hunting um, and yeah, thank you for joining us, Mark. I hope you enjoyed yourself as well. We had some great questions. Absolutely. Thank you very much. And uh, yeah, happy, happy manta -ing. <laughs> Yeah, hopefully we can all get back to the mantas soon. Um, Mark, where can we find you on social media? You, um, you can't because I'm an old retro grouch who doesn't do social media. So. <laughs> okay, cool. <laughs> but you what about um it's conservation org isn't it for conservation international yeah. Yeah. so that's um 
one of the things that Mark works with. Um, yeah, thank you to everyone for watching our webinar. Um, as always, you can find out more information about the Manta Trust, the Manta Trust affiliate projects all around the world, um, our wonderful scientific advisors, and all things Manta Rays on our website and our social media pages. Um, we do have some more webinars coming up. We're dropping down to one a week now, and we're going to start having panel discussions. So we have a really cool one coming up next Thursday. Um, that will be released on the website and on our social media pages in the next few days. So keep an eye out. Um, but it's going to be a really exciting chat between a few cool speakers. Um, we would love for you to support our research and our conservation um, initiatives. So one of the ways you can do this is by joining the Cyclone. It's a members only hub where we share all of our latest videos, latest research, um, latest trips and things like this. So it'd be great if you join that and any funds raised will go towards Manta conservation and research. Um, that's it for me for now and hopefully see some of you next week. And just a big thanks to Mark again. Have a great day, Mark, or evening actually. It's night time now, isn't it? So, yeah. All right. Good All night right. or good morning. Bye, guys. Bye.